We're going to get started with our next presentation by Dr. Mitch Fleischer. He's a double board certified, certified licensed family physician specializing in anti-aging regenerative medicine, peptide therapy, exosome and stem cell therapy, advanced musculoskeletal injection therapy, constitutional homeopathy, nutritional and botanical medicine, IV therapy, chelation and detoxification therapy, biooxidative therapy, and bioidentical biomimetic hormone replacement therapy. With over 30 years experience practicing the gentler art and science of integrative medicine. So let's give, the, give Dr. Fleischer a warm welcome. I just want to say it's a, a deep honor and privilege to speak to such a distinguished group. Uh, I really honor you for what you do as, as holistic dental physicians. Uh, I am a medical physician, as you've heard. Uh, I work a lot with holistic physicians in referring for um, deamalgamation, things that they need detoxification. In fact, one of the first articles I ever wrote that was published in um, the Townsend Letter um, almost 30 years ago was on the naturopathic de detoxification of mercury, which has been plagiarized a lot since then, but it's okay. Um, and so I understand the importance of this. Um, when my good friend, Rich Fisher asked me to speak at your group. I was wondering, okay, how am I going to, how can I approach this? So I'm a physician. And so I scoured my cured case reports and I found one that actually has a good case that I, I, I selected the remedy I gave, the homeopathic remedy, based on some really interesting dental symptoms along with everything else. But I also wanted, I wanted to use this talk as an opportunity to introduce you to other systems of healing. Uh, integrative systems of healing, not only classical homeopathic medicine, but medicinal peptide therapy, nutraceutical therapy, because if these are things that you can apply in your own practice uh, that can add a lot to patient care. There's so much that these, dif these three disciplines can do uh, to cure serious disease or mitigate. Because really, the real underlying purpose of this is to achieve what uh, our three wonderful speakers this morning, who I greatly honor and respect, are seeking to do is to reestablish balance in people's lives. And one of the most important things that Dave Martin pointed out, and I strongly adhere to it, because it basically is the underlying principle of, fundamental principle of homeopathy, is there really is only unity. There is only God, and we are all part of that same body. Yeah, but, but in order to be able to bring reestablish balance and homeostasis in, a, in, an, in a, our patients, our clients, we have to look at the uniqueness of each individual. And so these are tools that allow us to very carefully assess that unique individuality and select remedies that are specific to be able to bring them back to balance to homeostasis so they're part of the bodyguard again. So, I'll begin the case, and this is a case I selected um, because it illustrates all the facets of the integrated therapies. And it was in a patient that had completely and totally failed allopathic care, but this is gonna give me an, uh, an ability to be able to introduce you to some of the principles of how these, these things work. Okay, so this is a cured case study to illustrate how to integrate homeopathy, peptide therapy, and nutritional medicine in serious pathology. Uh, this was a case of a very painful bilateral chronic thrombophobitis and persistent cellulitis of the lower limbs of this individual. And it began after a, an episode of spontaneous bilateral deep vein thrombosis. There was no history of trauma, infection, or any unknown pathology. The patient is a 54-year-old Caucasian male who came for integrative medical therapy after failing several courses of heparin, uh, coumadin, warfarin, oops, Eliquis, strange how it does that, Perdaxa, Xeralto, and also broad spectrum antibiotics, both intravenous and oral. So they really threw the book at him with, with, with all the possible anticoagulants. With Eliquis, Pradax, and Xarelto have a 
really wonderful side effect that they permanently anticoagulate you. So if you have an, el an elderly patient and they accidentally fall and hit their head, they bleed into their head and can't be stopped. <laughs> so they're not great drugs to have people on. I, one of my jobs uh, as an integrated physician, when patients come to me with a big sack of medicines, and you know, the average 65-year-old th these days is taking 12 different allopathic drugs. Often, they're taking medicines to treat the effects of the other medicines. So, my job is to get them off of that stuff. So, his allopathic physicians were unable to control the progressive disease process with conventional modalities. And they were actually discussing the possibility of bilateral lower limb amputations above the knee. And this guy has a very busy IRS agent. <laughs> he didn't want to exactly want that. He didn't have a desk job. He actually was in the field. Uh, due to per the persistent severe thrombobitis and the high risk of recurrent DVT and potential pulmonary embryo and cerebral vascular accident or stroke. And the patient very vociferously informed me that he angrily refused these options, and he used a couple of expletives to explain exactly how they talk, talk to them. <laughs> so, on his initial physical examination, uh, his lower limbs from just, uh, just about the margin of the knee down to the ankles were very warm. In fact, you could feel the heat emanating off of them but hand five or six inches away. They were very violaceous or purplish. They were severe lymphedema, and uh, all the way down to the ankles and they were extremely tender to the slightest palpation, just the slightest touch, and it, it was very difficult for him to walk. He would, he would just walk like this. That's all he could do, or he's in exquisite pain. And no matter, no, no matter the uh, pain medications helped it. You know, he, was on, he had been opiates and the rest of it, he tried everything, nothing helped. So again, standing and ovulation were very painful. And the, cardi the heart and lung exam and neurological exam were essentially normal. And the remainder of the physical examination was also no normal too. This is what it looked like initially. And this is just one picture. We have to, he was his, actually his cell phone, and he gave me a, borrowed it, and I uh, took a picture of it. Uh, and that went all the way up to below the knee on both legs. The family history was remarkable for recurrent blood clots, DVTs, in his father and, and paternal uncles, two of them, thromboembolism in his younger brother, strokes in two paternal uncles under the age of 60, and the anatomical pathophysiology of the initial presentation of the lower limbs revealed diffuse inflammatory microangiopathy, uh, the capillaries and venials, and I asked him, um, had he gotten the vaccine. And he says he was, they were try, the IRS was trying to force him to get it, but he was already in such a mess that they said, okay, maybe we won't do this. He had a microembolic obstruction of the small and medium-sized venules, resulting in lymphatic congestion and edema, and regional hypoxia and toxic cellulitis. So the hypoxia is what led to the violaceous occur, uh, appearance. And there's also chronic venous stasis dermatitis. Initial lab workup showed a sed rate of 60, which is pretty high. CRP cardiac, which is a measure of vascular inflammation, was 78.74, which is very high. The ASO titer, another measure of inflammation, was extremely high, 1,043. And I said, you know, there's got to be a reason why he's clotting like this. So I did a whole factor workup and found that his factor weight, uh, eight activity was very elevated. And the ANA ruling out autoimmune disease was negative. And all the other labs were unremarkable. What was really interesting is that he had been to other doctors for uh, more than almost a year before he came to see me and no coagulation factors, and no coagulation factors were other drawn by any of the doctors and I couldn't understand why. So, I figured the, the initial therapy convention has got to be one that addresses his widespread microcoagulopathy and angiitis, the inflammation of the blood vessels. We had to address that first to get the blood flowing again, to be able to get the lymph and everything out of that system. So, what I used was 
natural anti-inflammatories. Astaxanthol is a lipophilic anti-inflammatory polyphenol, polyphenol complex. This stuff works fantastic. It was a combination of three different kinds of lip, very lipid-soluble anti-inflammatories that actually help. Uh, I've used it very frequently in cardiovascular disease, coronary disease that, um, that helps to decrease the inflammation the, uh, and decreases plaque formation. Interestingly, it also deposits when you take enough of it in the, in the, uh, the uh, dermal fat and it absorbs uh, UVB light and superoxide radicals and prevents sunburns. Natto NSK Mega is a vitamin K free uh, form of natto kinase. Natto kinase, it's, it's comes from, was originally uh, uh, discovered by a Japanese scientist who was researching um, ancient Japanese traditional uh, medicine, and he was looking at the different foods, because natto, uh, you know what natto is? You ever seen that? It's, it's, like a, it's almost like a, uh, a, a cottage cheese, a sour cottage cheese-like delicacy in sushi. It's interesting tasting, but um, they, they knew that in Shun medicine, the, the ninjas would take it themselves and give it to their horses because it, had, it uh, helped heart energy or shin energy. And they didn't know why, but he researched and he found out when he made an extract of it and he looked and he put clots under a microscope and made it, put the extract on it, it would dissolve, completely dissolve the clot. And he, it worked on very young blood clots up into very old blood clots. And what they discovered was the natto kinase, and, and, and kinase is, a, is an enzyme that cuts. What it does is it, it um, breaks the bonds in fi and fibrin. You know, we have in our bloodstream uh, a protein called fibrinogen. And when we have injury to the, uh, to the vascular endothelium, the first thing that happens is that fibrinogen is cleaved to fibrin. It, it creates a cobweb-like clot over the area and then you cut platelets and microphages and everything, and that's what the, it's like our inside wet scab to heal the lining of the endothelium. And when we got a scab from cutting our skin, that's the same thing that happens. It's a, basically a fibrin clot that collects white bloods and red blood cells. So this cleaves that. And plasmin X is actually an extract uh, of a different, a, a different kind of uh, um, uh, nidokinase developed by UCA, UCLA Harbor General Cardiovascular Research Group this bacillopeptidase F, and it's very potent at dissolving clots. I've used this in treating a lot of people with DVTs and pulmonary emboli. It's very effective. I also gave him inflamase, which is a mo multiple protease enzyme complex. Uh, a lot of pancreatic uh, uh, type enzymes with also catalase and, and SOD superoxide dismutase, so they're very anti-inflammatory. So I figured this guy is a mess. I'm going to hit him with everything I can got to be able to digest these clots. I also gave them Serasilk, which is another form called Serapeptidase, and these all work synergistically to dissolve different parts of the clot. I also employed medicinal peptide therapy, and KPV is a very interesting compound. I'll, I'll explain these in more depth, but this is a, a natural anti-inflammatory compound that's a fragment of a molecule in our brain called alpha-MSH, uh, alpha melanocyte stimulant hormone. Uh, MSH is, alpha-MSH is actually what controls the immune system of your gut, where 70% of your immune system is. And KPV is that anti-inflammatory fragment. And we have creams, we can use it as an injection, we take it orally and topically. So given the amount of inflammation and pain he has, I've, I've found that KPV works very, very well at decreasing the inflammation, which is the cause of the pain and I use it for musculoskeletal disorders of all sorts. Very effective. And I also wanted to help his immune system calm down the, anti, the inflammatory reaction that was going on to pre prevent it from propagating. And one of the things we have in, in um, medicinal peptide therapy are immunopeptides. Well, when we were very young, we had this big gland in our chest with the thymus gland, and it, it produces over 200 different peptides. And uh, the two most important are thymosin alpha-1 and thymine and thymosin uh, beta-4. Thymosin alpha-1's job is to balance the innate and adaptive immune system. And when the innate immune system is too low, you tend to have too much inflammation, uh, you're, you're, uh, you're more susceptible to be invaded by pathogens and also cancer cells, you can't fight them well. And when the adaptive immune system is too strong, you tend to have autoimmune allergic disorders, you want to balance them, and that's what TA1 does.
So he was given that subcutaneously. I also gave him thymus in beta-4, which is another thymic peptide, and its, its main function is in controlling inflammation and preventing sclerosis, scarring. So TA1 and TB4 work together. That's why I gave him that. And a little bit about the proteus enzymes. I don't know, have anybody heard about the proteus enzymes? Do you use them in your practice? Good, okay. These are really powerful tools. And there's actually a lot of really good research out there about using proteus enzymes uh, perioperatively uh, to prevent all sorts of you know, pain and inflammation uh, at a, a, like a pelvic or uh, if a cabbage is, if there are any sort of surgery, you can use these very effectively, and they do not have the side effects of non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or steroids. Of course, they're actually human communication molecules. So the protease enzyme is, um, uh, is a, that catalyzes proteolysis. It breaks down the proteins into smaller peptides or single amino acids, which are easier to clear from the inflamed tissue. And they do this by cleaving the peptide bonds by hydrolysis. And they have potent anti-inflammatory, anti-fibrinolytic, and anti thrombotic properties. And they effectively use in surgical worms, as I mentioned, and also in burden debridement without damaging healthy tissues. And here's, you can look at this. This is some of the research articles I pulled up for you about this. You can check out that later. And I want to introduce you to peptide therapy. It was just, this is an amazing field of medicine that's really just evolved over the last 10 to 20 years. And it's going to be expanding greatly over the next several decades. So peptide therapy is an evolving cutting edge medical science in which specific bioidentical protein amino acid sequences called peptides are used to repair, regenerate, support, and improve the structure and function of different parts of the body and mind. And well-known examples uh, that occur naturally in the human body are insulin. Insulin is the most famous peptide, and its job is to open up pores and cells, let sugar in, other stuff up, and make fat. That's all it does. And uh, glucagon, it does the exact opposite of insulin. ACTH, which controls adrenal function, also a peptide. Human growth hormone, or somatotrophin, uh, which really is the, the most powerful master peptide in the human body. It it's, regenerates the brain. It's a neuropeptide. Regenerates the cardiovascular system. Uh, helps regenerate bone, muscle, joint, skin, what have you. Very important tool. And thyroid hormone is also a peptide, too. And there's actually over 7,000 known naturally occurring peptides in the human body. And more are being identified all the time. There's over 60 uh, medicinal peptides currently in clinical practice, and more are being developed. And peptide therapy is becoming much more popular with integrated physicians, and I hope soon dental physicians as well, uh, because they're highly specific and very effective in their therapeutic actions. Uh, they're typically very safe and extremely well tolerated when prescribed accurately. It's very important to understand the difference between pharmaceutical drugs and medicinal peptides. With conventional allopathic pharmaceutical drugs, the mind and body are always, they always have a reaction that unfortunately includes a lot of unpleasant toxic side effects. That's when you look at the PDR, you have a, you know, a couple of lines of the indications for the drug, and then you have several paragraphs of the adverse reactions. Those are all the reactions of the drug. You know, it's a euphemism. I mean, it's, what's true is those are all the actions of that drug. They're just selecting out for a few things, but it's basically suppressing all, all drugs, basically, all allopathic drugs, when they're given in, in uh, uh, material doses, are essentially enzymatic toxins. That's the way they work. Whether it's aspirin, an antibiotic, an anti-cancer agent, doesn't matter. It's destroying, it's impeding some sort of natural enzymatic reaction, hoping that you'll get some positive result. But unfortunately, we know what actually happens. And this is due to the fact that uh, these are foreign molecules, unfamiliar to the body, biochemically, and they force changes and distortions upon our natural, mental and physical physiology that often reacts badly. In contrast, with bioidentical human medicinal peptides, the mind and body will always have a response. That's because these are molecules that are already in us. And the body, when, you, when, you, when you give that medicinal peptide back to the body, it says, oh, thank you. <laughs> I needed that, basically. I have one, of the, one of the peptides I use an awful lot 
is one called BPC-157, which means body protection compound. It's a 15 amino acid peptide produced in the lining of our stomach, whose job is to control inflammation and any uh, damage to the whole lining of our GI tract. And it also helps support the immune system in our pyrus patches and our large intestine. So it's both an immunopeptide uh, and a gastrointestinal healing agent, works fantastic in ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, inflammatory disease, celiac disease. I have almost all my patients I give BPC who have celiac disease, I never have to prescribe it again. They're calling me back for refills because they feel so much better on it. It's also a neuropeptide too, so it helps the brain. And uh, with a lot of people with a lot of people with ADD, ADHD, PDD, even adults who have that, it's often due to uh, an imbalance in the gut-brain connection. And BPC actually helps a lot of those conditions as well as any gut problems. And so the, what's wonderful is that you, if you prescribe these accurately, which isn't too terribly hard to do, they're really safe and non-toxic. We really don't see much reaction. And basically, it's just due to the fact that these are messenger molecules. They're human communication molecules, the which the body's already familiar. And, you know, the, the cells and tissues in our mind and body use these innate inborn medicinal peptides to communicate with each other and to tell what them to do and what not to do, right? And in fact, you know, uh, back in the uh, 1990s or the 2000s, there was a big thing about giving um, growth hormone to people. And the problem with, with giving just straight growth hormone is that it usually, it, it's secreted in a diurnal rhythm by our brain in femtogram amounts, 10 to minus 15, so you can't give a small enough shot of it. So when you give a super physiological doses, it creates a problem. Like for the first two years that they did research in the Medical College of Virginia, uh, Rudman and Associates, uh, for the first two years, the, guy, the, the patients, men and women in their 60s, 70s, and 90s were doing great. And then after the two-year mark, they started getting strokes, heart attacks, and cancer. Because when you mess with mother measure, you get problems. So instead, what we do now is research went into, okay, how is it the rest of the body tells the brain, the pituitary gland, to make more growth hormone? Well, we actually have proteins called growth hormone releasing hormones or growth hormone releasing peptides produced by all the cells and tissues that tell the brain, okay, we need more, make some. And it makes it the exact physiological dose. So it's a much safer way. So we're learning as time goes on, this is still a young science, how to apply these things that are safe and create the effect we want to have. And as they basically guide and balance all the metabolic and regenerative functions that serve to keep the body healthy. And when they're properly prescribed, and administered by a trained physician, you really want to get some training to figure out how to do these things. There's so many of them, and so many different dosage ranges and conditions to use them in. Uh, once you have the training, you can really help your patients tremendously. And some of the, pep, uh, the benefits, increased energy and stamina, better mental function and focus, a strengthened immune system infections with the thymic peptides, improve recovery from illness and wounds. Thymus and often one, TA1 I found was one of the most useful tools uh, during the major part of the COVID epidemic. Uh, uh, I took it myself every day for two, almost two years because I was, I was seeing lots of acute cases of COVID. And it kept me very healthy. And then I ran out of it in about March of 2021 and figured, oh, I'm, I'm fine. And there were hardly any patients coming anymore. And then one month later, I got a slew of them <laughs> coming in, and I got exposed. And that weekend, my wife and I, who's a naturopath, we worked together. We both got COVID, and I was sick for, for six and a half weeks. Fortunately, a series of 12 different homeopathic remedies I took, I didn't, have to, didn't miss any work. Oh, I felt like I had an elephant in my chest. We still survived it using these kind of things, and I didn't have to be hospitalized or take anything else. And I also treated a lot of my patients with the protocols um, that our illustrious physicians talked about earlier. Uh, as a member of American Frontline Doctors, I found that ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine, adequate amounts of vitamin C, vitamin D3, especially with, you want to use K2 with D3, works better, metatetranone, and zinc picolinate. These things work fantastically well, fantastically well. And basically, the reason you take hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin and quercetin is that they're, they're all, um, they help zinc bind to the receptor the ACE2 receptor, angiotensin 2 receptor, that um, the, the M spike protein binds to that allows the virus to take over the cell, if you even believe in those viruses. But that, they work extremely well. And it also increases muscle mass and tone, 
uh, increases mo uh, bone density, especially the growth hormone, and we have out, there are a lot of growth hormone um, analogs that work extremely well. Uh, we also, there's a lot of really excellent peptides that work in cosmetic therapy. In fact, one of the, there's a particular peptide, uh, GHKCU, which we naturally produce in our bodies and a lot when we're younger and it's in our skin, that regenerates collagen and elastin fibers. And the very high-end, expensive uh, um, cosmetic creams that women will sometimes buy, and some men, especially in San Francisco, uh, contains GHKCU in very small amounts. And that's the main ingredient. They charge you like 300 bucks for an ounce for this stuff. It's a lot cheaper when you buy it directly from a compounding pharmacy, but it works fantastically well. Also, it can improve hair. I've given injections of some of the peptides into some people that were nearly bald, and it helped regenerate hair. Definitely um, with, will create, uh, will generate li lipolysis and weight work loss, helps with cholesterol and cardiovascular function, and definitely uh, is very effective for joint and muscle pain. I use a lot of the pe uh, peptides when, when I do what I call joint regeneration therapy, and we've been able to take people that were told they had bone-on-bone -bone disease and regenerate the cartilage and, and have proven that uh, radiographically. Really aggravates the orthopedic doctors, but, you know, sorry. And uh, also can improve and regenerate sleep. Of course, sex drive is important to everybody. And there are peptides exactly for that. There's a whole industry growing in, in Los Angeles where a lot of doctors are using them. There are certain peptides you can uh, spray, uh, use intranasally, and they increase, increase libido. And uh, then uh, there's a broad spectrum of health conditions that we use it for, anti-aging, regeneration of the entire body, tissue repair, bones, cartilage, ligaments, tendons, joints, muscles, and skin, balancing endocrine hormones, very, very effective in, in re-stimulating the adrenal glands and the thyroid glands to function better for enhancing growth hormone production, that's the GHRH, it's the GHRPs, hair regrowth and restoration, inflammatory diseases of all sorts, acute and chronic, this is an example, and arthritis, degenerative and rheumatoid, a whole range of autoimmune diseases. I've treated several patients with MS, even ALS, who have responded very well to peptide therapy, and cognitive mood and memory enhancement. Uh, there's a particular peptide in, that's produced naturally in the brain called BDMF, uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and its job is to regenerate and, and uh, restore the nerves, the, the soma, the axon, and the dendrites. And one of the most important things in memory and cognition is to have lots of uh, dendritic connections to other nerves. The more connections you have, the more memory recall you have. So the BDMF's job is to do that. And uh, as people get older, they have less and less of it. Uh, there's a particular peptide that was developed called dihexa that is 10 to the 7th times more potent. That's trillions of times more potent than a 25 to 50 milligram dose I've seen turn someone who is de developing early dementia, just wake them right up. So there's some incredible tools we have now. And these are the conditions, again, we can improve cellular energy production, enhance vitality, cytoprotection protection from oxidative stress, especially surgically, Alzheimer's disease and dementia, post-stroke recovery, obesity and weight management, osteopenia and osteoporosis, anxiety and stress disorders, depression, insomnia. Now, KPV, I'll get into a little bit of these, these so you'll know how to use them. So this KPV is a potent anti-inflammatory peptide that's showing a promise in a great number of, of conditions. And it's a, the most active research is in the anti-inflammatory bowel disease, where the peptide has been shown to have substantial progress in all kinds of inflammatory bowel disease. So I will give it, uh, for someone who has inflammatory bowel disease, whether it's ulcerative colitis or celiac disease or whatnot, I'll give BBC-157 and KPV together orally, very small doses, 500 micrograms twice daily, and within, within four to six weeks, you'll see a complete resolution of diarrhea, bloody stools, the rest of it and the pain just goes away. And, they, and like you can wean them off their sulfosalazine and all the other drugs they're on. Which, and these don't have any side effects with the, unfortunately the other drugs do, especially the steroids. Uh, it's been shown in animal studies to be very self-infective when administered by all routes, orally, intravenously, subcutaneously, and topically. Um, and it's uh, been shown in research in wound healing to be very, very effective. And 
KPV and similar peptides become mainstays, not just in wound healing, but in scar reduction following surgery. And I've had people with the keloids where I've inject, just used it with a subcutaneous uh, injection, you can help resolve the scar over a course of several weeks to a few months. Thiamus and alpha-1, this is another very important peptide. Now, what I have to say, unfortunately, about this one, the FDA, in their infinite wisdom, decided to create a nationwide ban of thymus and alpha-1. Why? Because one foolish doctor in Missouri decided to put on his website he uses thymus and alpha-1 for treating COVID. Aww. Complete idiot. And also, the last pharmacy in the United States had provided it, now can't anymore because their FDA lawyer said, eh, eh. Fortunately, uh, there's another peptide. Just in case the FDA is listening, I'm not going to mention it, but I'll talk to you. I'll tell you what it is afterwards. That's another thymic peptide that works just as well. There, The pharmacies are now just adjusting the dose up to find what's an equivalent. Okay? I'm very careful not to give away all the secrets online. <laughs> Who knows what they'll do next? And it just took one doctor doing a stupid thing like that for them to take away something they know works. This is the kind of nonsense that, that well, the other, all the other doctors have been experiencing. We're, you know, we have tools that really work for COVID and a lot of other serious diseases, and they are continually taking away our tools. Like they used to, like 20 years ago, they used to go around, uh, uh, you know, come after me and other, uh, uh, my colleagues and try to find some way to bust us and, and take away our licenses, but we weren't doing anything wrong. So they're not doing it anymore because they lost in court. Now they're going after our sources of tools. <sighs> it's crazy, okay? So TA1 is an immune peptide, but it modulates the innate and adaptive immune system, as I mentioned a moment ago, and enhances cellular and humular defense, defenses against infections and malignancies. This is one of the number one agents I use in virtually every cancer patient I treat, and I treat by default a lot. Uh, on the East Coast, a lot of my colleagues will send me cancer patients because I, I will take care of them, homeopathically, nutritionally, and, and this way too. And the, I have several patients who in stage three and four cancer who are now completely stabilized, taking this on a regular basis. It really works. And it's been studied in cystic fibrosis, tuberculosis, CMV infections, which can affect the liver and lungs a lot, all kinds of respiratory disorders, and chronic hepatitis and, uh, and cancer. Thymus DB4 is a thymic peptide derived from the thymus gland also, and it improves blood vessel growth angiogenesis, regulates wound healing, especially prevents uh, scarring by controlling uh, fibroblastic activity, it reduces oxidative stress in the heart and central nervous system, as well as all the organs and tissues. And I find that TA1 and TB4 work really well if you have an overactive immune system uh, and there's a lot of, um, of fibrotic activity that's developing. And it helps in cellular protection, tissue repair, regeneration, and remodeling of injured and damaged tissues. I've used it in several patients who are, who've developed for several different reasons, whether it's by infection or uh, alcohol, uh, hepatic cirrhosis, and it stabilizes them uh, so that they uh, don't progress to end-stage disease. And there's also a lot of interest in anti-aging medicine because of, as we age and great, great uh, chronic inflammatory problems, a lot of those have to do with sclerosis of tissues. So at the four-week follow-up consultation, uh, by using the nutritional therapy and the peptide therapy, his pain was reduced about 30%. The erythema and edema was reduced about 20%, and I modified the regimen to include PPS. And this is pentasan polysulfate. It's a special kind of a medicine used in neurology a lot for uh, um, bladder problems, especially interstitial stitis, but it's also a really good anticoagulant. Uh, short-acting one. So I gave it to him intramuscularly in the lower limbs just to accelerate uh, the resolution of the cellulitis and the clotting. We did that actually just three times. And I also scheduled him for constitutional homeopathic treatment. And in constitutional homeopathy, I, I'm sure Dr. Fisher has explained some of this, what we do is look at the whole person. We look at all the physical symptoms and what, what's, what's unique to that individual, all the mental and emotional symptoms, and, the, and, and the, we, try, we seek to paint a picture of someone 
and how they're experiencing life. And homeopathy comes from a, 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 a unified theory of life that you just can't treat the physical without the mental emotional. And you just can't treat the emotional by suppressing it with drugs, antipsychotics and drugs, without treating the whole body. So it's a, an extremely holistic science. So we look at the uniqueness of someone's experiencing symptom. If they have uh, a pain, we want to know exactly what a sensation is, what it feels like, what, make, what are the modalities, what makes it worse, what makes it better. So whatever their diagnosis is, we see what's unique and individualizing about them compared to 100 other people or 1,000 other people with the same diagnosis. And then when you add in the individualizing emotional symptoms, what their worries, anxieties, grief, shames, what's molded them as an emotional person, the way they think or don't think, their beliefs, disbeliefs, uh, dreams, daydreams, delusions, and you look at the cross or the nexus of all that symptoms, that, that constitutional constellation of physical and mental emotional symptoms that describes them as a whole person, that's what we analyze homeopathically. And we go into our Materia Medica, which are encyclopedia of medicines, and we find the one that's most similar. Because homeopathy comes from the term homeos pathos, similar suffering. It's based on the principle of similia similibus corinthia, let likes be cured by likes. So our goal is to find the most similar remedy, because based on the Hippocratic principle, you know the three laws that Hippocrates stated how to heal? The first principle, he said, would you use medicines that produce symptoms similar to the disease process to cure? The second principle, you use medicines that produce symptoms opposite the disease process to suppress and hold in bay, which is what allopathic medicine is for. Allios pathos means contrary suffering, antibiotics, antihistamines, things like that. And the third principle is healing by faith. So we have to use all three. So I scheduled them for a constitutional, and I have a whole history that they have to fill out. Um, and I analyze, so it's, when they fill it all out, I study it in advance for several hours, and it's like sitting down with them for 24 hours. So pentasan polysulfide, I mentioned, is a semi-polysulfide uh, xylan, and it's a form of a hemicellulose polymer that's a really good uh, anticoagulant. It has anti-inflammatory effects on skin mucosa, muscles, and joints. Um, it also has anticoagulant properties, as I mentioned. It's used in interstitial cystitis and arthritis. But you, you never inject this inside the joint because it can make it bleed. Some people had made mistakes like that. You always put, just put it subcutaneously or intramuscularly. So at the date of the constitutional homeopathic consultation, his pain was reduced by 40%. His erythema and lymphedema were reduced by about 25%. And his constitutional and emotional, mental emotional symptoms were noted in that he was very loquacious, very rapid talking, jumping from subject to subject. He was very anxiously restless. In fact, when I was in my examination room, I was sitting at my desk writing, and he was pacing back and forth rapidly, talking at me a mile a minute. And I was just watching him go back and forth like a ping pong ball. He was just wild. And uh, he was also very, very suspicious and censorious in that he was really tearing apart all the physicians that had ever seen him caring about the government and everything. So th these are all symptoms, because they were expressed very so strongly. And he also told me he hates taking medicines. So these are all the, the mental and emotional symptoms. The physical general symptoms, which affects the whole person, that's what a physical general symptom is, and local, local symptoms, or what we call local particulars, are the, just the things that affect a part of the body. He generally feels worse in warm, wet matter, so that's important, constitutional, physical, general. He generally feels worse after sleep. He would, wake, he would go to bed and wake up in the morning with much more pain, feeling more anxious, more miserable. That's a physical general. And he had specifically an inflammation of lower limbs, pain of palpation of the lower limbs, painful swelling of the lower limbs, a bluish purplish discoloration, the violistic discoloration due to the hypoxia, and he also had a very peculiar symptom, because I ask all the body, I do a uh, removal of systems, and I, I ask all the body parts. And he mentions to me, out of the blue, that his, fee, his teeth feel too big, as if they were longer. He said, that's in homeopathy, when we hear something like that, that we love hearing things like that, because that's what we call an SRP, a strange, rare, and peculiar. Because that's help, that helps us 
put a round peg into a round hole rather than jamming a, a round peg into a square hole. When we find these really unique symptoms, we, we look up in, the, in our materia medica, in our repertories, do, do we have, do we have the, is the remedy when we need to give for everything else in that symptom? So that was the dental symptom <laughs> I found in him. And he also says his teeth feel painful when he brushes. So this is the repertorization. And what a repertorization is, we have books called, the repertories are compendium of clinical symptoms. So you have the symptom, and then all the remedies that cause that symptom in varying degrees of intensity. So let's see. So we have loquacity, very strong, it's a four, and oops, it's, grade, it's graded from one to four degree of intensity. So when I see a four, I realize that's a very important symptom uh, in, in this remedy, and it's also an important symptom for him. He also jumps subjects, it has that, loquacity changing sub subject to another, the uh, anxious or nervous restlessness, the suspiciousness, the suspicious nature, uh, his aversion to drug, taking drugs, it had that. It has a warm, worse from warm, sultry weather, well, damp, damp weather, worse after sleep, very strong. It has the elongated sensation of the teeth. I actually was able to find that symptom, I love that. And then uh, pain when cleaning or brushing the teeth, inflammation of the lower limbs, worse from touch, with the purplish or violation discoloration, with the swelling, uh, bluish swelling of the legs, edematousness, and painful swelling. So that's what we call a, a pretty complete repertorization covering the entire body, mind, motion, and physical symptoms. And then this is a bar graph just showing the intensity. This is the remedy. This is how strong it was compared to dozens of other remedies. And, and this, I could, that's as far out as I could go, but this is the strongest remedy in hundreds of different choices. So the initial prescription was the remedy Lachesis mutis. And Lachesis is the Bushmaster snake. It's the largest, most toxic snake in the world. It's in Brazil. Uh, this, this is a snake that will actually chase down a man or a woman and kill him and eat him. <laughs> it's a pretty nasty snake. It's also, also hypersexual. It actually has the only snake in the reptile in the world that has two penises. They're intense. And uh, th their venom uh, is, uh, breaks down blood. That's one of the ways it destroys you. So I gave it to him in low potency, 12C, uh, given the degree of pathology, uh, two drops and stirred in water, half teaspoon daily to start. Uh, and again, Lachesis mutis is the homeopathic operation of the venom of the, of the American, South American Bushmaster snake. And it contains an array of potent fibrinolytic, hemolytic toxins, hyaluronidases, metalloproteinases, and metalloproteinases, or MMPs, those are the enzymes that uh, break down collagen elastic and cancer cells, interestingly, produce excess amounts of MMP so they can migrate through tissues and metastasize. So one of our treatments in, in, in uh, integrative medicine is to use uh, natural substances that block MMPs and prevent metastasis. Uh, and lachesis, because of its homeopathic principle, can do that. It can actually block what it, can block what it normally produces on the crude level, on the energetic level. Uh, phospholipidases, uh, A2, this is another a kind of an enzyme that breaks down the uh, uh, phospholipids in the body, bradykinin, penetrating pen peptides which create pain, and a whole array of other ones. What I did was to gradually increase the homeopathic potency every few weeks to watch the clinical response. So we don't want to overstimulate his system as he's healing. So I went from a 12C to a 30C to 200C, 1M, the LM potency, and the potency scale uh, in homeopathy, we have an X potency, which is 10 to the minus one, or a C or a, a centesimal potency, 10 to the minus two, 100th dilution. So what a 12C potency is actually 10 to the minus 24. And if you remember your physiochemistry, anything beyond 6.023 times to the 23rd molecules per mole is beyond there being a single molecule in there. So I gave him actually a remedy that was pure energy. Now that's what homeopathic remedies really are. They're, they're, they're the, the remedies are made in such a way, the pharmace, homeopathic pharmaceutical process ex, extracts and potentizes the remedy and it's actually extracting the electromagnetic principle 
of the original material substance. And when that's given to someone according to the homeopathic principle, it acts as a bioenergetic catalyst or stimulus to give, to give their God-given innate defense mechanism the energy information to do what it would have done to begin with. It's kick-starting their healing engine. So as you have to do it carefully in practice. When you have someone with really serious disease, you start at lower potencies in your body, gradually build up so you don't create a healing aggravation. And the uh, one M potencies is 10 to the minus uh, two, uh, 2,000. So this is just pure, completely pure energy. And then the LM potencies are a 10 to 50,000th dilution, which are a gentler kind of potency. So I gradually built up the remedies. And the doses were always given diluted in water because it has, enhances the therapeutic efficacy. And this is the appearance of his limbs at four weeks. The erythema and edema was already beginning to resolve. He was less, it was less painful. He was able to ambulate a little bit better. This is the appearance of his limbs at six weeks. You notice the violaceous nature is um, significantly resolved. The venous stasis dermatitis was also starting to calm down. The scaling was, was beginning to resolve. This is the appearance at eight week follow up. And he was now able to walk around the house without much pain, not taking any analgesics. This is the appearance at 10 weeks and was completely resolved. Everything from above the ankles to the knees, which was pretty much gone at that time, he still had some uh, increased calf circumference. This is at 12 weeks. This is at the 14 week follow up, and he was fully ambulatory at this point and pain free and able to sleep through the night. And this is the follow up at, at 16 weeks. Both sides. Completely normal, and he, this is now almost three years. He's completely normal to this day and with no recurrence. And the patient reported at the 16 week follow up, the lower limbs are now completely free of pain, swelling, heat discoloration, and scaly eruption. He's able to stand and walk normally, also able to do regular exercise, which he was unable to do for well over a year. His quality of sleep is greatly improved. He's more tolerant of warm and damp weather, so that's a physical general symptom changing. His teeth now feel of normal length and are painless on brushing. I thought that was a really cool resolution of a strange run and peculiar. <laughs> and, and this is the kind of thing you can use in your practice. I mean, there, there's a whole section in uh, the homeopathic material medicals, or the encyclopedias, on teeth, a whole chapter on teeth. So, I have lots of ca anecdotal cases I could, I could talk about if I have time of how I've treated my patients when they call up and they say, I've got, you know, I think I have an abscess or my tooth is hurting me and I'll just take their symptoms over the phone and find out what's unique and individualizing and tell them to go to the local health food store and get that remedy and they get relief within a few hours or a day or two. And he feels calmer, a lot less nervous and restless and this is where the the, the differential between the nutraceuticals and the peptide therapy is I, the homeopathic remedy works profoundly on the mental and emotional level, symptomology, whereas the peptides and uh, nutraceutical agents may not necessarily do that. That's why I combine them together, because they work much better. Because you're using a combination of bioenergetic stimulation and balancing along with um, um, biochemical balancing. He's still very talkative, although at much less pressured speech, and he was actually sitting in the chair, not pacing around and just talking to me at the follow-up. Uh, follow-up labs, the SED rate, the CRP cardiac, and the SO SED rate were now all within normal limits. So we had lab evidence of, of the diminution of inflammation. His factor eight activity was now down to 124%. And given his family history, suggesting pos uh, possible inherited factor VIII coagulopathy, he chose to stay on maintenance dose of the acids ethylplasminex and nano and SK mega, and that's worked very well for him. He's actually turned on the rest of his family to it too. So, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Or we can also, I can also give you some case dental cases that I've 
taken. Would you like that? Okay. I had, <laughs> this also often occurs to me if I go, to, if I go, go shopping <laughs> in the local city, Charlottesville, 10 minutes, okay. And uh, 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 invariably a, a patient would say, oh, hi, Dr. Fleischer, and they'll bring somebody out when their friend's over, he's got such and such and such. Well, I, haven't, I, haven't, I, had, I was at a, a wedding, oh, about a, a month ago, uh, of the daughter of uh, one of my best friends, and uh, the, the, the husband of um, the daughter of the bride had a terrible toothache, and, and someone brought him to me and said, could you help him? And I said, okay, what if, what, I was sitting there eating hors d'oeuvres. <laughs> I said, okay, what are your symptoms? And said, what does it feel like? I said, what do you mean does it feel like? I said, that's the worst kind of homeopathy. I said, what kind of pain are you having? Well, it's shooting pain. Shooting pain where? Right up into the head. And is it throbbing? Yeah, a little bit, but it's more like boom, boom, shooting at my head. And uh, does it hurt when you bite? And it hurts some. Does it hurt when you drink the, the wine that you're drinking? The warm is no. How about something called terrible? Those symptoms are very, very, very pathognomonic for the remedy Hypericum perforatum. Okay? So I, I, the, the household where the wedding was, was one of my homeopathic patients. So she went into her house and she got Hypericum 30C, it's another minus 60 dilution. He puts pellets on his tongue, he put the pellets on his tongue right where we're sitting in a group together, and then we began conversing. And within about a minute or so, he says, what the heck? I said, what's going on? He said, I, it doesn't hurt anymore. One dose, Hypericum 30C. And what turned out that could have been a dental abscess, of course, when, you tapped, when I tapped and examined and tapped on the tooth, it had that similar um, uh, pain that you get from dental abscesses, just tapping. And he took, about, uh, he took doses over the course of the next five days and was fine. And when he went to see his dentist two weeks later for cleaning, he said there was, there was what looked like there was a resolving infection in the tooth. And he didn't need to treat him. So that was just a few doses of a simple remedy. And I've had other cases, people calling me. Um, I had one patient, a postmenopausal woman, who uh, called w uh, uh, late in the evening with a lot of pain in a, a back molar. I think it was number three. That's the one up here, right? Back there. And uh, um, it made her extremely irritable and angry. And uh, she was bitching and moaning and complaining to her husband, that you did this to me, all the rest of it. And I said, that's an interesting symptom. And uh, also was worse from biting and worse from cold drinks. She couldn't hardly eat anything, uh, couldn't sleep because of the pain. And the symptoms repertorized out very nicely, physically, mentally, emotionally, for sepia officinalis, which is the ink of the cuttlefish, interestingly enough, which is an interesting substance in that um, it's, it's a, the cuttlefish extracts seawater and concentrates minerals in it. And it has virtually every mineral on the planet in that ink. Uh, so it's a very interesting substance. And she took a, a, a 200 C potency of it, and again, her symptoms resolved very quickly. The anxiety, the irritability, the pain went away, and she took about two or three doses and was fine. So I've had a lot of cases like that where rather than them having to, I'm, I don't want to take business away from you guys, <laughs> but you, you could learn to do this and resolve a lot of pains, especially um, uh, that you, they can, a lot of your patients can buy remedy kits and have them at home. They have 50 different remedies of 30 C's and 200 C potencies. And rather than having to go to the pharmacy and buy an antibiotic, which is gonna mess up their bowel or use non if you give them the right remedy, they can get very rapid relief. And it not, only, it not only takes away the pain and the inflammation, but the source of the problem too. And you can actually resolve, uh, resolve an abscess. One of the best remedies for resolving, there's a couple of different remedies for resolving abscesses that are really good. You might want to look them up. Staphys agria is a really good one with very exquisite pain and people that are, uh, tend to be very sensitive souls and uh, are easily suppressed. You know, if you ever find a history of, your, of, a, of a woman who has a lot of dental pain and an apparent abscess and uh, they're very mild natures and very yielding, and uh, five minutes, okay. <laughs> and uh, um, they have a lot of stabbing pains and throbbing pains. Staphys aegra could be a very good remedy for them. Um, another remedy for uh, infections, uh, hydrastis canadensis, which is golden seal root powder in homeopathic form. 
very, very helpful. So these are very useful tools, and I, I would exhort you to learn how to use them because they're very, very effective in clinical practice, and you can save your patients an awful lot of money from allopathic drugs and save them from the side effects. It also saves you from liability, too, because if they get, in a, you know, if, if a lot of dentists, not you guys, but you prescribe things like clindamycin, which is a horrible antibiotic, because I've had so many patients come to me with uh, um, uh, infections from the antibiotic. They wind up getting clostridia difficile enterocolitis from just a few, two or three doses from that drug. So you can avoid that by just giving an acute homeopathic remedy and get them over the problem without any liability. Also, there are a lot of very, very useful um, peptides you can learn to use. Uh, KPV is a great substitute orally for uh, acute and chronic inflammation, in what's it, whether it's a dental problem or a sinus problem or what have you. And it also has natural antibiotic properties because it stimulates your own immune system's ability to create an immune defense. BPC and KPV work together to do that. Uh, so it will not only work in gastrointestinal infections, it'll work in oral or sinus infections as well. Very, very effective. Okay. Do I have time left? <laughs> I have one. How much? Just a couple of minutes. Well, I, I, hope, I hope this has given you some tools. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Staphysagria is S-T-A-P-H-Y-S-A-G-R-A. Staphysagria. Hydrastis is H-Y-D-R-A-S-T-I-S. Canadensis. Um, but there's a, sepia is S-E-P-I-A. Easy. But, you know, if you, if you look in any, uh, pick up any Materia Medica, or a, a well, actually, repertory is better. Pick up a repertory and just go to the tooth section and just scan through the rubrics. It'll teach you tons. In fact, that's one of the ways we begin training in homeopathy. You're actually just told to pick the chapters and just read through all the rubrics, and you realize, oh my God, there's so many more symptoms than I was ever led to believe when you went to regular medical and dental school. We, there's so many individualizing symptoms, and some of them are so strange. Like, uh, I remember having a, a, a case of, of actually a medical student who had severe, severe pharyngitis and was completely exhausted. Um, and uh, she just went, went, went through about a dozen different antibiotics from her regular uh, GP and was not getting better. So, so she asked me to take her case. I take her case. And the most peculiar symptom she had of the pharyngitis were, was when she stuck out her tongue when I examined her, she had severe pain at the root of her tongue. So I looked under mouth, um, pain, tongue, protruding the tongue, and there were only three remedies. And one of the remedies fit all the other mental, emotional, and physical symptoms because she had, she it was worse from warm drinks. Uh, the, the the back of her throat looked purplish, and it was a remedy, phytolacticondra, which is pokeweed. You know, it grows all over Virginia, and a 200 C potency, and she was better in three days. That's that's this is fun stuff. <laughs> when you can do this kind of medicine and get people so, so much better. Um, yes? What did you say the book was? They're called repertories. R-E-P-E-R-T-O-R-Y. P-R-Y. Repertory. So the repertory is the book, uh, it's a compendium of the clinical symptoms, which you call rubrics. The rubric is the symptom, like you saw up there, and then all the remedies that are causing it in varying degrees. That's a, and the whole, you can look at the, the tooth section, just, it's a big section of the book, because, uh, you know, homeopathic dentists, like Rich, back, you know, back in the 1800s, I'm not saying you're that old, I mean, they, they used, they were able to treat people uh, and uh, very, very effectively homeopathic remedies with a few remedies when there weren't a lot of the technology that we have now. Those are the, and what's, the, one of the beauties of homeopathy is that what was true about homeopathic medicines 150 years ago is as true today because it's truly empirical medicine. It's medicine based on what, which observed, no armchair theorizing. We give medicines, find out what symptoms they create through provings, and then record them. And then you use those symptoms in clinical practice and then find out what's more, even more true. We're continually adding to the, to the information we have about each remedy. 
So I hope that's been helpful for you. And uh, basically, the fundamental understanding, yes? I, uh, I use MacRepertory, or it's now called SHS, but, uh, uh, SHS um, but there's also a really good one called Radar Opus. So depending on which, whether you have a Mac or a PC, some work, uh, but those are the two best ones i found. Um, so essentially, you know, I hope I'm giving you some useful tools to look at and consider in your practices, because essentially what we're all doing here is helping to restore balance on our patients, understanding that we are all one being, and we are all individuated from that one being, but still, the fundamental goal is to bring us back into that unity. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation.